I really like working with Azure Command Line Interface, if you couldn't tell by now. And it's also known as the CLI. I don't know Azure very well, and I find the help feature extremely useful when trying to create a new Azure resource, as I've been doing in the previous episodes. Now, there is a drawback, however, and that is that you can end up with a bunch of cryptic text strewn around your application, or worse yet, you forget what commands you used to create a given resource and have to go through the discovery process all over again. Today, I'm going to organize the commands that I've been working with in the previous episodes. I'll walk you through how I do things from simple script files all the way down to orchestrating things with Make. If you're not a CLI fan, but are curious, which I hope you are, hold on tight as this episode is for you. I personally like thinking about the Azure CLI as a text browser. All of the UI is stripped out. There's no HTML, no CSS. It's just text. And the portal, it's, it's okay, okay, the portal's okay, but I really just like the speed of the Azure CLI. The text comes back real fast, and I've got all the descriptions I need to figure out what's happening next. Simply by using the dash H argument, the help argument, it's kind of like browsing a web page, but a lot faster, and only text. We're going to want to be sure that our Azure environment can be recreated easily, and we want to make sure that everybody can see how we've built things, so let's take a second and put our commands into a script file. I'll do what I normally do, which is start sloppy and then slowly improve. Shell scripts are executed top-down and in order, so I'll need to be sure that I start by creating the resource group, then the app service plan, the web app, and so on. I'm not going to make you watch me type all of this out one more time, but here's what that script looks like. As you can see, a shell script is just a series of commands executed in exactly the same way as if I typed it directly into the terminal. Let's run this and make sure that it works. Oops, it didn't work, and a bunch of not good things happened. I have a syntax error somewhere in my script, which happened after my resource group was built. The error did not stop the script from executing, so other resources may or may not be living up on Azure right now. Now there is good news, however, we can fix this problem, and we will later on. We can also batch delete everything that we just created, in other words, rolling back, by deleting our resource group using az group delete n and pass in the name of the group, which in my case is Velzi. Okay, our resource group is deleted, so now let's fix our problem, which is silliness on my part. I'm missing two line continuation characters, the backslash, in the web app command and the app service command, and I can quickly fix that. Now I can rerun this command, and after 30 seconds or so, I can see that everything is built as I hoped it would be. A shell script without comments can be frustrating, especially if you don't know the binaries being used. This is where traditional programming and shell scripting can differ. We are orchestrating the building of resources here, not necessarily executing logic. It's okay to be super obvious. Much better. These comments will help people who aren't familiar with the shell scripts and those who aren't familiar with the Azure CLI's commands. It's a small thing, but your team, not to mention your future self, will really appreciate it. For instance, this comment contains the log configuration settings right here, everything I can choose from, copy-pasted from the CLI documentation. This is extremely helpful if you want to tweak the scripts later on. Let's keep rolling with the improvements by making this script file a little bit more idiomatic. It's a good idea to use variables to avoid hard coding values in your script and to reduce repetition. My application name is repeated a few times in here, as is the resource group name. So I'll fix that by creating a set of variables at the top of the script. I'll set the application name, the resource name, plan name, and location right here at the top. To use these values, I simply prepend a dollar sign to the name of the variable down below. The value is then expanded when the script is run. Great, this reads a lot better. In fact, it's starting to feel a little bit like programming, even though it is orchestration. We can turn this script into something a bit more general purpose if we move every single value that's not part of the command itself into a variable. This includes the SKU and my Docker Hub image tag. There we go. Now this is a generalized script that we can rerun whenever we need a container-based web application. All we have to do is set the variables right at the very top. I feel good about this, but there's one extra step that we can take to improve this script and our overall efficiency. Now, I use Zshell instead of Bash because I find the conveniences to be extra useful. The main reason I use Zshell, however, is because of the oh my zh, <laughs> I don't know how to say that, project from Robbie Russell. I mentioned this in a previous episode, but it's worth mentioning here one more time. 
This project is a shell framework which offers all kinds of useful shortcuts and plugins that make programming, especially if you're a CLI person like me, a lot more efficient. One of the plugins I absolutely love is the .env plugin, which will load the variables, functions, and aliases in a .env file right into the shell whenever you navigate into a directory. Using a .env file for this project will work out well, especially if I'm going to end up with additional shell scripts later on, which I surely am. My node project can also read from this file using the .env module. I already have this plugin installed, so let's try it out. I'll move my variables into the .env file and then use the printenv command to see all my environment variables because I want to verify that they're not in my current environment. I'll cd one directory up and then back down, and I'll run printenv again, and there they are. All right, now let's verify that our script works using the .env file. I deleted the resource group off camera, and I'll skip ahead here as well, and yes, it works. I'm a huge fan of make because it helps to orchestrate shell commands, and I think we could use some of that orchestration right here. As you might have noticed, I have a make file in the root of my application, which builds and runs my site. I created that in episode 003, and I don't want to confuse the two things, so I'm going to create an Azure directory and put another make file in there. If you've never used make, it's kind of a dinosaur from prehistoric days of C programming. In technical terms, it's a build tool that orchestrates code files and turns them into binary objects. If you're familiar with build tools of any kind, rake, grunt, MS build, whatever, then make will be kind of familiar. In fact, a lot of those tools were based on what make does. The bottom line is this, make turns one file into another, following some rules. I'll discuss those rules as we go along. Now, the first thing that I tend to do is to create an all target and a phony target, which I spelled wrong in the videos you see here, using an EY, which would just be a Y at the end, sorry about that. That's what each of these labels is called in a make file, a target. Each target is supposed to build one thing, and that one thing is described by a shell command also called a recipe. We have a nice set of commands so far, so let's add each one as a target. Great, now I'll copy and paste each of my shell commands that lives in my script file under each one of my targets, so it's a little bit more descriptive. I'll copy and paste my variables right up top, and I don't need to do anything special with them, but I do need to change the reference uh, within the recipes. This syntax, dollar sign in parentheses, tells make to substitute the variable value before handing it off for execution. Great. All the commands and variables are set. Now comes the fun part, orchestration. I can orchestrate what happens when by simply defining dependencies. I'll go top to bottom here and specify that my plan target requires RG to have completed before it executes. The web app target needs a plan and logging requires a web app. You get the idea. Make will execute the very first target in the make file by default, which is all, so to get everything to work properly, I need to execute the last target as a prerequisite to all in the chain, which is logging. All right, let's make sure that this works. I'll run this file using the make command, which will execute my all target. As you can see, each command is output into the terminal so I can see what's going on. The orchestration is working great. This works, but we're missing the best part, our rollback feature. I'll delete the resource group once again so we can amp out this make file and make it shine. While the resource group is deleting, I'll change things in my make file by using a resource group name right here that doesn't exist. Blarg. Right, this will throw an error that comes from the Azure CLI because, well, the resource group doesn't exist when trying to create the app service plan. Now let's run our make file and kaboom! This is great. Notice that the execution stopped. We still have a resource group that was completed with the previous target, and that's okay. We can clean things up with a special target devoted to do just that. A typical makefile has a dedicated target to clean up the build artifacts in the event of an error, or if the user just wants to rebuild everything entirely. Not surprisingly, that target is called clean. I would use that here, but I'd rather be ultra clear for the context of this project, which is a video for people who might not be completely familiar with make. So I'm going to call my target rollback. This target is simply going to drop the resource group entirely as you've seen me do. Great, to use this, we can leverage the return value of make, which like each of its targets is either one or zero, depending on if there was a failure in all of the build. That means we can call make and evaluate its result, executing the rollback if there was an error. And that command is make, or with two pipes, make rollback. 
Nice and simple. Let's see if it works by executing the exact same make file with an error. Yes, victory. Okay, we're almost there. Let's add a few more things for convenience. We'll want to see our site after we deploy it, so let's pop in a new target here called Open. I also like to look at the logs while my site is loading up, so I know what's going on, so I'll add a logs target as well. Okay, the last thing I need to do is to reset the all target to logs, which is my last command, and we can start this one more time. Running the command and waiting for just a little bit. Haha, <laughs> there's my browser. Open to my site's URL and the familiar spinning icon. If you recall from previous episodes, container deployments can take just a little while. I'll skip ahead about four minutes and show you both screens side by side. My terminal on the left, which is tailing my site's logs, and my browser on the right. Hey, and look at that, something's happening. Azure's pulling down my container image and building everything, which again, it takes a while, so I'll skip ahead to the interesting part, which I froze right here. The image has been pulled and the container started, and I froze it right here because a split second later, kaboom, the same 502 server error that I've seen in previous episodes. In fact, I have seen this error every single time I've tried to deploy using an image from Docker Hub. We know what to do next when we see this error. We just refresh, doing that, and I can see that my site is up. I hope this episode is helpful and you can check out the code uh, in our repository by clicking the link below. Thanks so much for watching. See you again soon.